1536 through 1540. Plot and Counterplot Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. Part 1. From the moment that Henry abruptly left the lists at May Day, on the receipt of Cromwell's letter detailing the admissions of Smeaton, he saw Anne no more. No pang of remorse, no wave of compassion passed over him. He easily believed what he wished to believe, and Anne was left to the tender mercies of Cromwell to be done to death. Again Henry was a prey to profound self-pity, forever having fallen under the enchantment of such a wicked woman. He, of course, was not to blame for anything. He never was. He was always the clement, just man, whose unsuspecting goodness of heart had been abused by others, and who tried to find distraction and to forget the evil done him. On the very night of the day that Anne was arrested, the Duke of Richmond, Henry's son, now a grown youth, went, as was his custom, into his father's room at Whitehall, to bid him good night and ask his blessing. The king, we are told, fell a weeping as he blessed his son, quote, saying that he and his sister, Mary, might well be grateful to God for saving them from the hands of that accursed and venomous harlot who had intended to poison them. End quote. That Anne may have planned the assassination of Mary is quite probable, even if she had no hand in the shortening of Catherine's days, and this may have been the real hidden pretext of her death, acting upon Henry's fears for himself. But if such were the case, Henry, at least, was deserving of no pity, for when it was only Catherine's life that was in danger, he was, as we have seen, brutally callous, and only awoke to the enormity of the, quote, venomous harlot, unquote, when Cromwell made him believe that his own safety was jeopardized. Then no fate was too cruel for the woman he once had loved. On the day preceding Anne's trial, Jane Seymour was brought from Sir Nicholas Carew's house to another residence on the river bank, only a mile from Whitehall Stairs, to be ready for her intended elevation as soon as the Queen was disposed of. Here Jane was served for the few days she stayed, quote, very splendidly by the cooks and certain officers of the king, and very richly adorned. End quote. So certain was Henry that nothing would now stand in the way of his new marriage that Jane was informed beforehand that on the fifteenth, by three in the afternoon, she would hear of her predecessor's condemnation, and Anne's cousin and enemy, Sir Francis Bryan, eagerly brought the news to the expectant lady at the hour anticipated. The next day, when the sword of the French headsman had made Henry indeed a widower, the king only awaited receipt of the intelligence to enter his barge and seek the consolation of Jane Seymour. At six o'clock in the morning of the 20th May, when the headless body of Anne, barely cold, still awaited sepulture, huddled in an old arrow box in the church of St. Peter within the tower, Jane was secretly carried by water from her residence to Hampton Court, and before nine o'clock she had been privately married to the king, by virtue of a dispensation issued the day previously by the accommodating Cranmer. It would seem probable that the day after the private espousals, Jane traveled to her home in Wiltshire, where she stayed for several days, whilst preparations were being made in the king's abodes for her reception as queen, for all the A's had to be changed to J's in the royal ciphers, and traces of Anne's former presence abolished wherever possible. Whether Henry accompanied his new wife to Wiltshire on this occasion is not quite certain, 
though from Sir John Russell's account it is probable that he did. In any case, the king and his new wife visited Mercer's Hall in Cheapside on the 29th May, St. Peter's Eve, to witness from the windows the civic ceremony of the annual setting of the watch, and on the following day, 30th May, the pair were formally married in the Queen's Closet at Whitehall. The people at large looked somewhat askance at this furious haste to marry the new wife before the shed blood of the previous one was dry, but the court, and those who still recollected the wronged Princess Mary and her dead mother, were enthusiastic in their welcome to Jane. The Emperor's friends, too, were in joyous mood, and Princess Mary at Hunston was full of hope and eager to be allowed to greet her father and his new wife now that that woman was dead. Chapus, we may be sure, did not stand behind the door now when he went to court. On the contrary, when he first visited Whitehall a few days after the wedding, Henry led him by the hand to Jane's apartments and allowed the diplomatist to kiss the queen, quote, congratulating her upon her marriage and wishing her prosperity. I told her that, although the device of the lady who had preceded her on the throne was the happiest of women, I had no doubt that she herself would realize that motto. I was sure that the emperor would be equally rejoiced as the king himself had been at meeting such a virtuous and amiable queen, the more so that her brother, that is, Sir E. Seymour, afterwards the Duke of Somerset, had been in the Emperor's service. I added that it was almost impossible to believe the joy and pleasure which Englishmen generally had felt at the marriage, especially as it was said that she was continually trying to persuade the king to restore the princess to his favor as formerly. End quote. Most of Chapus's courtly talk with Jane, indeed, was directed to this point of the restoration of Mary, but the new queen, though inexperienced, had been well coached, and did not unduly commit herself, only promising to favor the princess, and to endeavor to deserve the title that Chapus had given her of, quote, peacemaker, end quote. Henry strolled up to the pair at this point, and excused his new wife for any want of expertness. Quote, As I was the first ambassador she had received, and she was not used yet to such receptions, he, Henry, felt sure, however, that she would do her utmost to obtain the title of peacemaker, with which I, Chapus, had greeted her, as besides being naturally of a kind and amiable disposition and much inclined to peace she would strive to prevent his henry's taking part in a foreign war if only out of the fear of being separated from him End quote. but all these fine hopes were rapidly banished jane never possessed or attempted to exercise any political influence on her husband she smiled sweetly and in a non-committal way upon the Princess Mary and upon the imperialist and moderate Catholic party that had hoped to make the new queen their instrument. But Cromwell's was still the strong mind that swayed the king. He had obtained renewed control over his master by ridding him of Anne, and had, at all events, prevented England from being drawn into a coalition with France against the Emperor, but he had no intention, even if it had been possible, of going to the other extreme, and binding his country to go to war against France to please the Emperor. Henry's self-will and vanity, as well as his greed, also stood in the way of a complete submission to the papacy, and those who had brought Jane Seymour in, hoping that her advent would mean a return to the same position as that previous to Anne's rise, now found that they had been over-sanguine. 
Charles and Francis were left to fight out their great duel alone in Italy and Provence, to the general discomfiture of the imperial cause, and, instead of hastening to humble himself at the feet of Paul the Third, as the pontiff had fondly expected, Henry summoned Parliament and gave stronger statutory sanction than ever to his ecclesiastical independence of Rome. Anne's condemnation and Elizabeth's bastardy were obediently confirmed by the legislature, and the entire freedom of the English church from Rome reasserted. But the question of the succession was that which aroused the strongest feeling, and its settlement the keenest disappointment. Now that Anne's offspring was disinherited, Princess Mary and her friends naturally expected that she, with the help of the new queen, would once more enter into the enjoyment of her birthright. Eagerly Mary wrote to Cromwell, bespeaking his aid, which she had been led to expect that he would give, and by his intercession she was allowed to send her humble petition to her father, praying for leave to see him. Her letters are all couched in terms of cringing humility, praying forgiveness for past offenses, and promising to be a truly dutiful daughter in future. But this did not satisfy Henry. Cromwell, desirous, in pursuance of his policy of keeping friendly with the emperor without going to war with France, or kneeling to Rome, hoped to bring about peace between Mary and her father. But the strongest passions of Henry's nature were now at stake, and he would only accept his daughter's submission on terms that made her a self-confessed bastard. And against this, the girl, as obstinate as her father, and as righteously proud as her mother, still rebelled. Henry's son, the Duke of Richmond, was now a straight stripling of eighteen, already married to Norfolk's daughter, and, failing issue by Jane, here was an heir to the crown that might carry the Tudor line onward in the male blood, if Parliament could be chicaned or threatened into acknowledging him. So Mary was plied with letters from Cromwell, each more pressing and cruel than the previous one, driving the girl to distraction by the king's insistence upon his terms. Threats, cajolery, and artful casuistry were all tried. Again Mary turned to her foreign advisers and the king's rebellious subjects for support, and again her father's heart hardened when he knew it. Norfolk, who with others was sent to persuade her, was so incensed with her firmness that he said if she had been his daughter, he would have knocked her head against the wall until it was soft as a codlin. But Norfolk's daughter was the Duchess of Richmond, and might be queen consort after Henry's death, if Mary were disinherited, so that there was some excuse for his violence. Those who were in favor of Mary were dismissed from the council. Even Cromwell was in fear and Jane Seymour was rudely snubbed by the king for daring to intercede for the princess. At length, with death threatening her, Mary could stand out no longer. Without even reading it, she signed with a mental reservation, and confident of obtaining the papal absolution for which she secretly asked, the shameful declaration forced upon her, repudiating the papal authority, and specifically acknowledging herself a bastard. Then Henry was all amiability with his wronged daughter. He and Jane went to visit her at Richmond, whither she had been brought, giving her handsome presents of money and jewels. Liberty was given to her to come to court, and stately service surrounded her. But it was all embittered by the knowledge that Parliament had been induced to acknowledge that all the king's children were illegitimate, and to grant to Henry himself the right of appointing his own successor by letters patent or by will. Alas! The youth 
in whose immediate interest the injustice was done, was fast sinking to his grave, and on the 22nd July, 1536, the Duke of Richmond breathed his last, to Henry's bitter grief. Mary's prospects again became brighter, and all those who resented the religious policy and Henry's recalcitrancy now looked to the girl as their only hope of a return to the old order of things. Chapus, too, was ceaseless in his intrigues to bring England once more into a condition of obedience to the Pope. That should make her a fit instrument for the imperial policy, and soon the disappointment that followed on the elevation of Jane Seymour found vent in the outbreak of rebellion in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. The priests and the great mass of the people had bent the neck patiently to the king's violent innovations in the observances that they had been taught to hold sacred. They had seen the religious houses, to which they looked for help and succor in distress, destroyed and alienated. The abuses of the clergy had doubtless been great, and the first measures against them had been welcomed but the complete confiscation of vast properties, in the main administered for the benefit of the lowly, the continued enclosure of common lands by the gentry newly enriched by ecclesiastical plunder, and the rankling sense of the scandalous injustice that had been suffered by Catherine and Mary, for the sake, as the people said, of the king's lustful caprice, at last, provided the extreme militant Catholic party with the impetus needed for revolt against the crown. Imperious Henry was beside himself with rage, and for a time it looked as if he and his system might be swept away in favor of his daughter, or one of the Poles, who were being put forward by the Pope. The bull of excommunication against Henry and England, so long held back, was now launched, making rebellion righteous, and the imperial interest in England, which was still strong, did its best to aid the rising of Henry's lieges against him. But the rebels were weakly led. The greater nobles had for the most part been bought by grants of ecclesiastical lands, and Norfolk, for all his moral baseness, was an experienced and able soldier. So the pilgrimage of grace, threatening as it looked for a time, flickered out, and the yoke was riveted tighter than ever upon the neck of rural England. To the party that had hoped to make use of her, Jane Seymour was thus, to some extent, a disappointment. But her placid submissiveness, which made her a bad political instrument, exactly suited a husband so imperious as Henry and from a domestic point of view the union was successful during the summer jane shared in her husband's progresses and recreations but as the months rolled on and no hope came of offspring ominous rumors ran that jane's coronation would be deferred until it was proved that she might bear children to the king and some said that if she proved barren a pretext would be found for displacing her in favor of another. Indeed, only a few days after the public marriage, Henry noticed two very beautiful girls at court, and showed his annoyance that he had not seen them before taking Jane. After six months of marriage without sign of issue, Henry began to take fright. The Duke of Richmond was dead and both the king's daughters were acknowledged by the law of England to be illegitimate. He was already forty-six years of age, and had lately grown very obese, and his death without further issue or a resettlement of the succession would inevitably lead to a dynastic dispute, with the probable result of the return of the House of York to the throne in the person of one of the Poles, under the Aegis of Rome. Whenever possible, Jane had said a good word for the Princess Mary, and Henry began to listen more kindly than before to his wife's well-meant attempts 
to soften him in favor of his daughter. The Catholic party was all alert with new hopes that the king, convinced that he could father no more sons, would cause his elder daughter to be acknowledged his heir. But the reformers, who had grown up numerously, especially in and about London, during Henry's defiance of Rome, looked askance at a policy which, in time, they feared might bring back the old order of things. The mainstay of this party at court, apart from the professed Lutherans and the new bishops, were those who, having received grants of ecclesiastical property, despaired of any return to the Roman communion and the imperial alliance without the restoration of the church property. Amongst these courtiers was Jane's brother, Edward Seymour, Viscount Beauchamp, who had received large grants of ecclesiastical lands at intervals since 1528. He was a personal friend of the king, and had taken no active part in the intrigue that accompanied his sister's elevation, though after the marriage he naturally rose higher than before in the favor of the king. He was a clever and superficially brilliant, but ostentatious and greedy man, of no great strength of purpose, whose new relationship to the king marked him out as a dominating influence in the future. The Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, upon whom Henry had depended as generals, were now very old and ailing, and there was no other peer but Cromwell of any ability in the councils. Even thus early, it was clear that Seymour's weight would, notwithstanding the circumstances of his sister's rise, be thrown on to the anti-papal side when the crucial struggle came. He was, moreover, a new man, and as such, not welcomed by the older nobility, who, though desirous of retaining their church plunder, were yet bound by their traditions against bureaucrats such as Cromwell, and the policy of defiance of the papacy that he and his like had suggested and carried out. Cromwell's own position at this time, 1536 through 1537, was a paradoxical one. It was he who had led Henry on, step by step, to entire schism and the plunder of the church. It was he who not only had shown how to get rid of Catherine, but how to destroy her successor. And it was he whom the Catholic party hated with a wholehearted detestation for the king's acts as well as his own. On the other hand, he was hardly less distrusted by the reforming party for his efforts were known to be directed to a reconciliation with the emperor, which could only be effected conjointly with some sort of arrangement with the papacy. His efforts to please the imperialists by siding with the princess Mary during her dispute with her father led him to the very verge of destruction, whilst the young princess was being badgered into making her shameful and insincere renunciation of her faith and birthright, Cromwell, the very man who was the instrument for extorting her submission, sat, as he says, for a week in the council, considering himself, quote, a dead man, end quote, because the king believed that he was encouraging Mary to resist. Cromwell, therefore, like most men who endeavor to hold a middle course, was distrusted and hated by everyone and it must have been obvious to him that, if he could ensure the adhesion of the rising Seymour interest, his chance of weathering the storm would be infinitely improved. His son had recently married Jane Seymour's sister, and this brought him into close relationship with the family, and, as will be seen, led in the next year to a compact political union between the Seymour brothers, Cromwell, and the reforming party, as against the nobles and traditional conservatives. For the time, however, Cromwell held on his way, endeavoring to keep in with the imperialists and Mary, and it was doubtless to his prompting that Jane used her influence 
when at its highest point, to reconcile the princess personally to her father. To the great joy of the king, in March 1537, Jane was declared to be with child. The emperor had already opened a negotiation for the marriage of Mary with his brother-in-law, the Infante Luis of Portugal, and Henry was playing a waiting game till he saw if Jane would bear him a child. If so, Mary might go, although he still refused to legitimize her. But if no more issue was to be born to him, he could hardly allow his elder daughter to leave England and fall into the hands of the emperor. Charles, on the other hand, was extremely anxious to obtain possession of so valuable a pledge for the future as Mary, and was willing to go to almost any lengths to get her, either by fair means or foul, fearing, as he did, that the girl might be married discreditably in England, he thought even to Cromwell himself, in order to destroy her international value to Henry's rivals. As soon, however, as Jane's pregnancy was announced, Mary's position changed. If a child was born in wedlock to the king, especially if it were a son, there would be no need to degrade Mary by joining her to a lowly husband. She might, on the contrary, become a good international marriage asset in the hands of her father, who might bargain with Charles or Francis for her. The fresh move of Jane Seymour, therefore, in her favor, in the spring of 1537, when the queen's pregnancy had given her greater power over her husband, was probably welcome both to the king and Cromwell, as enhancing Mary's importance at a time when she might be used as an international political pawn without danger. Jane was sad one day in the early period of her pregnancy. Why, darling, said the king, how happeneth you are not merrier? It has pleased your grace, replied the queen, to make me your wife, and there are none but my inferiors with whom to make merry, with all your grace excepted, unless it would please you that we might enjoy the company of the Lady Mary at court. I could be merry with her. We will have her here, darling, if that will make thee merry, said the king. And before many days had gone, Mary, with a full train of ladies, was brought from Hunston, magnificently dressed, to Whitehall, where, in the great presence chamber, Henry and his wife stood before the fire. The poor girl was almost overcome at the tenderness of her reception, and fell upon her knees before her father and his wife. Henry, as usual anxious to throw upon others the responsibility of his ill-treatment of his daughter, turned to his counselors, who stood around, and said, Some of you were desirous that I should put this jewel to death. That were a pity, quoth the queen, to have lost your chiefest jewel of England. The hint was too much for Mary, who changed color and fell into a swoon, greatly to her father's concern. Part 2 At length, the day long yearned and prayed for by Henry, came. Jane had for some months lived in the strictest quietude, and prayers and masses for her safe delivery were offered in the churches for weeks before. In September, she had traveled slowly to Hampton Court, and on the 12th October, 1537, a healthy son was born to her and Henry. The joy of the king was great beyond words. The gross sensualist, old beyond his years, had in vain hoped through all his sturdy youth for a boy, who, beyond reproach, might bear his regal name. He had flouted Christendom, and defied the greatest powers on earth, in order to marry a woman who might bear him a man-child. When she failed to do so, he had coldly stood aside whilst his instruments defamed her and did her to death. And now, at last, in his declining years, his prayer was answered. 
and the house of Tudor was secure upon the future throne of England. Bonfires blazed, and joy bells rang throughout the land. Feasts of unexampled bounteousness coarsely brought home to the lieges the blessing that had come to save the country from the calamity of a disputed succession. The Seymour brothers at once became, next to the king and his son, the most important personages in England, the elder, Edward, being created Earl of Hertford, and both receiving great additional grants of monastic lands. In the general jubilation at the birth, the interests of the mother were forgotten. No attempt appears to have been made to save her from the excitement that surrounded her, and on the very day of her delivery, she signed an official letter, quote, Jane the Queen, unquote, to Cromwell, directing him to communicate to the Privy Council the joyful news. The most sumptuous royal christening ever seen was in bustling preparation in and about her sick chamber, and that no circumstance of state should be lacking. The mother herself, only four days after the birth, was forced to take part in the exhausting ceremony. In the chapel at Hampton Court, newly decorated like the splendid banqueting hall adjoining, where the initials of Jane carved in stone with those of the king, and her arms and device on glowing glass and gilded scutcheon still perpetuate her fleeting presence, the christening ceremony was held by torchlight late in the chill autumn evening. Through the long drafty corridors, preceded by braying trumpets, and followed by rustling crowds of elated courtiers, the sick woman was carried on her stately pallet, covered with heavy robes of crimson velvet and ermine. Under a golden canopy, supported by the four greatest nobles in the land, next to Norfolk, who was one of the godfathers, the Marchioness of Exeter bore the infant in her arms to the scene of the ceremony, and the Princess Mary, fiercely avid of love as she ever was, held the prince at the font. Suffolk, Arundel, and doomed Exeter, with a host of other magnates, stood around, whilst one towering handsome figure, with a long brown beard, carried aloft, in his arms, the tiny fair girl-child of Anne, the Lady Elizabeth, holding in her dainty hands the holy chrism. It was Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, looked at askance by the rest as a new man, but already overlapping them all as the uncle of the infant prince. During the Te Deum and the long pompous ceremony of the baptism, the mother lay flushed and excited upon her couch, whilst the proud father, his broad face beaming with pride, sat by her side, holding her hand. It was hard upon midnight when the queen gave her blessing to her child, and was carried back to her chamber, with more trumpet blasts and noisy gratulation. The next day, as was to be expected, she was in a high fever, so ill that she was confessed and received extreme unction. But she rallied, and seemed somewhat amended for the next few days, though ominous rumors were rife in London that her life had purposely been jeopardized in order to save that of the child at birth. They were not true, but they give the measure of the public estimate of Henry's character, and have been made the most of by Sanders, Rivadeneira, and the other Jesuit historians. On the 23rd October, the queen fell gravely ill again, and in the night was thought to be dying. Henry had intended to ride to Escher that day, but, quote, could not find it in his heart, end quote, to go. And the next night, the 24th October, Jane Seymour died. A sacrifice to improper treatment and heartlessly exacted ceremonial. Henry had not been married long enough to her to have become tired of her, and her somewhat lethargic placidity had suited him. She had, moreover, 
born him the long-looked-for son and his grief for her loss was profound and no doubt sincere much as he hated signs of mortality he wore black mourning for her for three months and shut himself up at windsor away from the world and above all away from the corpse of his dead wife for a fortnight jane's body embalmed lay in the presence chamber at hampton court for a week blazing tapers surrounded the great hearse and masses went on from dawn to midday in the chamber all night long the queen's ladies with princess mary watched before the bier until the end of the month when the catafalque had been erected in the chapel for the formal lying in state on the twelfth november with the greatest possible pomp the funeral procession bore the dead queen to windsor for burial in a grave in st george's chapel destined to receive the remains of henry as well as that of his third wife the mother of his son the writers of the time following the lead of henry and his courtiers never mentioned their grief for the queen without promptly suggesting that it was more than counterbalanced by their joy at the birth of her son who from his first appearance in the world was hailed as a paragon of beauty and perfection thanksgivings for the boon of a male heir to the king blended their sounds of jubilation with the droning of the masses for the mother's soul and the flare of the bonfires died down into the flickering tapers that dimly lit the funerals even henry himself in writing to give the news of his son's birth confessed that his joy at the event had far exceeded his grief for jane's death so far as the catholic party that had promoted it was concerned the marriage with jane had been a failure the pilgrimage of grace had been drowned in the blood of ruthless slaughter and partly because of mary's scruples and fears partly because they themselves had been gorged with the plunder of the church nearly all the great nobles stood aside and raised no voice whilst cromwell and his master still worked havoc on the religious houses regardless of jane's timid intercession boxley walsingham and even the sacred shrine of canterbury yielded their relics and images venerated for centuries to be scorned and destroyed whilst the vast accumulated treasures of gold and gems that enriched them went to fill the coffers of the king and their lands to bribe his favorites throughout england the work of confiscation was carried on now with a zeal which only greed for the resultant profit can explain the attacks upon superstition in the church by those in authority naturally aroused a feeling of greater freedom of thought amongst the mass of the people the establishment of an open bible in english in every church for the perusal of the parishioners do as indeed most of the doctrinal changes were to cranmer encouraged men to think to some extent for themselves but though for purposes to which reference will be made presently henry willingly concurred in cranmer's reforming tendencies and cromwell's anti-ecclesiastical plans for providing him with abundant money he would allow no departure from orthodoxy as he understood it his love for theological controversy and his undoubted ability and learning in that direction enabled him to enforce his views with apparently unanswerable arguments especially as he was able and quite ready to close the dispute with an obstinate antagonist by prescribing the stake and the gibbet either to those who repudiated his spiritual supremacy or to those who like the anabaptists questioned the efficacy of a sacrament which he had adopted for henry it was to a great extent a matter of pride and self-esteem now to show to his own subjects and the world that he was absolutely supreme and infallible and this feeling unquestionably had greatly influenced the progress effected
by the Reformation and Emancipation from Rome made after the disappointing marriage with Jane Seymour. But there was also policy in Henry's present action. Throughout the years 1536 and 1537, Francis and the Emperor had continued at war, but by the close of the latter year it was evident that both combatants were exhausted and would shortly make up their differences. The papal excommunication of Henry and his realm was now in full force, making rebellion against the king a laudable act for all good Catholics, and any agreement between the two great continental sovereigns in union with Rome boded ill for England and its king. There were others, too, to whom such a combination boded ill. The alliance between France and the infidel Turk to attack the Christian emperor had aroused intense indignation amongst Catholics throughout the world against Francis, and the Pope, utilizing this feeling, strove hard to persuade both Christian sovereigns to cease their fratricidal struggle and to recognize that the real enemy to be feared and destroyed was Lutheranism or heresy in their midst. During the emperor's absence and the war, Protestantism in Germany had advanced with giant strides. The princes had boldly refused to recognize any conciliatory council of the church under the control of the pope, and the pressure used by the emperor to compel them to do so aroused the suspicion that the day was fast approaching when Lutheranism would have to fight for its life against the imperial suzerain of Germany. Already the forces were gathering. George of Saxony, the enemy of Luther, was hurrying to the grave, and Henry his brother and heir was a strong Protestant. Philip of Hesse had two years before thrown down the gauge and had taken by force from the emperor the territory of Wurttemberg, and had restored the Protestant Duke Ulrich. Charles's brother, Ferdinand, who ruled the empire, clamored as loudly as did Mary of Hungary in Flanders and Eleanor of Austria in France for a peace between the two champions of Christendom, the repudiation by France of the Turkish alliance, and a concentration of the Catholic forces in the world before it was too late to crush the hydra of heresy which threatened them all. It was natural in the circumstances that the enemies of the papacy should be drawn together. A fellow feeling makes us wondrous kind, and a common danger drew Henry of England and Philip of Hesse together. Henry was no Lutheran, and did not pretend to be. He had been drawn into the Reformation by the process that we have followed, in which interested advisers had worked upon his passions and self-esteem but he had gone too far in defiance of Rome now to turn back, and was forced to look to his own safety by such policy as was possible to him. For several months after Jane Seymour's death, the envoys of the German Protestants were in England, in close negotiation with Henry and Cromwell. In order that a close league should be made, it was necessary that some common doctrinal standpoint should be agreed upon and infinite theological discussions took place to bring this about. Henry would not give way on any principal point, and the Protestant ambassadors went home again without a formal understanding. But though Henry remained, as he intended to do, thus unpledged, it was good policy for him to impress upon the Germans by his ruthless suppression of the monasteries, and his prohibition of the ancient superstitions, that he was the enemy of their enemy, and that if he was attacked for heresy, it would be incumbent upon the Lutherans to be on his side, even against their own suzerain. This was not, however, the only move made by Henry against the threatening danger of a joint attack of the Catholic powers. He had hardly thrown off his mourning for Jane, before he turned his hand to the old game of dividing his rivals, 
His bluff was as audacious and brilliant as usual. To the imperial and French ambassadors, in turn, he boasted that either of their masters would prefer his friendship and alliance to that of the other, and, brightly convinced that he would really be more likely to gain latitudinarian Francis than Charles, he proposed in the spring of 1538 that he should marry a French princess. As the two great Catholic sovereigns drew closer together, though still nominally at war in Italy, Henry became, indeed, quite an eager wooer. His friend, Sir Francis Bryan, was sent to Paris, secretly to forward his suit, and obtained a portrait of the Duke of Guise's second daughter, the sister of the King of Scotland's bride, Mary of Lorraine, with which Henry confessed himself quite smitten. He had, before this, only three months after Jane's death, made a desperate attempt to prevail upon Francis to let him have Mary of Lorraine herself, though she was already betrothed to the King of Scots, his nephew. But this had been positively and even indignantly refused. Even the younger daughter of Guise, beautiful as she was, did not quite satisfy his vanity. Both he and his agent Brian, who was a fit representative for him, disgusted Francis by suggesting that three other French princesses should be taken to Calais by the Queen of Navarre, Francis's sister, in order that they might be paraded before the King of England for his selection, quote, like hackneys, end quote, as was said at the time. He thought that the angry repudiation of such an insulting proposal was most unreasonable. Quote, How can I choose a wife by deputy? he asked. I must depend upon my own eyes. End quote. Besides, he added, he must hear them sing and see how they comported themselves. Perhaps, suggested the French ambassador sarcastically, he would like to go further and test the ladies in other ways, as the knights of King Arthur used to do. Henry colored at this, but vauntingly replied that he could, if he pleased, marry into the imperial house, but he would not marry at all unless he was quite sure that his new relation would prefer his alliance to all others. When, at length, in June, the truce of Nice was signed, and soon afterwards the fraternal meeting and close community between Francis and Charles was effected at Egmont, Henry began to get seriously alarmed. His matrimonial offers, to his surprise, were treated very coolly. All his attempts to breed dissension between the imperial and French ambassadors, who were now hand in glove, were laughed at, and the intimate confidence and friendship between his two Catholic rivals seemed at last to bring disaster to Henry's very doors, for it was not concealed that the first blow to be struck by the Catholic Confederacy was to be upon the schismatic heretic who ruled England. With Francis, there was no more to be done, for Henry and Brian, by their want of delicacy, had between them deeply wounded all the possible French brides and their families. But, at least, Henry hoped that sufficient show of friendship with Charles might be simulated to arouse Francis's jealousy of his new ally. Henry, therefore, began to sneer at the patched-up friendship, as he called it, and how about Milan? he asked the French ambassador, knowing that that was the still rankling sore, and soon he began to boast more openly that he himself might have Milan by the cession of it as a dower to Dom Luis of Portugal on his marriage with the Princess Mary, whilst Henry himself married the young widowed Duchess of Milan, Charles's niece, Christina of Denmark that clever, quick-witted woman whose humorous face lives forever on the canvas of Holbein in the English National Gallery. There had been a Spanish ambassador, Diego Hurtado de Mendoza, in England since the spring of 1537, 
to negotiate the portuguese marriage of the princess mary but the eternal questions of dowry security and the legitimacy of the princess had made all negotiations so far abortive now they were taken up more strongly by means of wyatt at madrid and by special envoys to mary of hungary in flanders but it was all buckler play as the imperial agents and charles himself soon found out henry and cromwell knew perfectly well that no stable alliance with the emperor was possible then unless their religious policy was changed and they had gone too far to change it without humiliation if not destruction to henry the real object of the negotiations being simply to obtain some sort of promise about the cession of milan by which francis might be detached from the imperial alliance but it was unsuccessful and for once the two great antagonists held together for a time against all lutheranism and heresy then henry and cromwell had to look anxiously for support and alliances elsewhere to the king it was a repugnant and humiliating necessity he had puffed himself into the belief that he was the most potent and infallible of sovereigns and he found himself for the first time scorned by all those he had reason to fear he the embodiment of the idea of regal omnipotence would be forced to make common cause with those who like the german protestants stood for resistance to supreme authority with usurpers like christian the third of denmark and trading democracies like lubeck with much hesitation and dislike therefore he listened whilst cromwell urged the inevitable policy upon him which led him farther and farther away from the inner circle of potentates to which he and his father had gained entrance in the course of the events related in the first chapters of this book cromwell's arguments would probably have been unavailing but for the opportune discovery in the usual fortuitous cromwell fashion of a dangerous aristocratic conspiracy against henry himself cardinal pole had been entrusted with the papal excommunication and everywhere impressed upon english catholics the duty of obeying their spiritual father by deposing the king whether anything in the form of a regular conspiracy to do this existed in england is extremely doubtful but the cardinal had naturally written to his relatives in england especially to his brother joffrey and perhaps to his mother the countess of salisbury a princess of the blood royal of york first joffrey was seized and carried to the tower and some sort of incriminating admission drawn from him by threats of torture though so far as can be gathered nothing but the repetition of disaffected conversations it was enough however for cromwell's purpose when he needed it and the fatal net was cast over pole's elder brother lord montague the marquis of exeter allied to the royal house the master of the horse sir nicholas carew sir edward neville and half a score of other high gentlemen known to be faithful to the old cause all to be unjustly sacrificed on the scaffold to the fears of henry and the political exigencies of cromwell even the women and children of the supposed sympathizers with the papacy were not spared and the aged countess of salisbury with her grandson and the marchioness of exeter with her son were imprisoned with many humbler ones the defences of the kingdom on the coast and toward scotland were rapidly made ready to resist attack from abroad which indeed looked imminent and when the noble and conservative party had been sufficiently cowed by the sight of the blood of the highest of its members when the reign of terror over the land had made all men so dumb and fearsome that none dared say to him nay cromwell felt himself strong enough to endeavor to draw england into the league of protestant princes and defy the catholic world the position for henry personally was an extraordinary one 
he had gradually drifted into a position of independence from rome but he still professed to be a strict catholic in other respects his primate cranmer and several other of his bishops whose ecclesiastical status was unrecognized by the pope were unquestionably and not unnaturally protestant in their sympathies whilst cromwell was simply a politician who cared nothing for creeds and faiths except as ancillary to state policy francis and even on occasion charles himself made little of the taking church property for lay purposes when he needed it he had more than once been the ally of the infidel against catholic princes and his religious belief was notoriously lax and yet he remained quote, the eldest son of the church end quote. charles had struggled successfully against the papal pretensions to control the temporalities of the spanish church his troops had sacked rome and imprisoned the pope and his ministers for years had bullied pontiffs and scolded them as if they were erring schoolboys excommunication had fallen upon him and his and as hard things had been said of him in rome as of henry and yet he was the champion of catholic christendom the conclusion is obvious that henry's sin towards the papacy was not primarily the spoliation of the church the repudiation of catherine or even the assumption of control over the temporalities but that he had arrogated to himself the spiritual headship in his realm in most other respects he was as good a catholic as charles and a much better one than francis and yet under stress of circumstances he was forced into common cause with the growing party of reform in europe whose separation from the church was profoundly doctrinal and arose from entirely different motives from those of henry the danger that threatened england at the time early fifteen thirty nine was not really quite so serious as it seemed for close as the alliance between charles and francis was old jealousies were not dead and a joint war against england would have revived them whilst the papal plan of treating england commercially as outside the pale of civilization would have ruined charles's subject and was impracticable but in any case the peril was real to henry and cromwell and under the stress of it they were driven into the attempted policy of a protestant confederacy at the end of january fifteen thirty nine christopher mont was sent to germany with the first overtures he carried letters of credence to philip of hesse and hans frederick of saxony with the ostensible object of asking whether they had come to any conclusion respecting the theological disputations held in the previous year between their envoys and the english bishops to establish a common doctrinal basis this of course was a mere pretext the real object of the mission being to discover to what extent henry could depend upon the german protestant princes if he were attacked by their suzerain the emperor a private instruction was given to mont by cromwell to remind one of the saxon ministers who had come to england of a former conversation about a possible marriage between the young duke of cleves and the princess mary and he was to take the opportunity of finding out all he could about the quote, beauty and qualities shape stature and complexion end quote, of the elder of the two unmarried daughters of the old duke of cleves whose eldest daughter sibylla had married hans frederick of saxony himself and was as bold a protestant as he was at the same time approaches were made to christian the third of denmark who had joined the evangelical league and gradually the forces against the papacy were to be knitted together an excuse also was found to send english envoys to cleves itself to offer an alliance in the matter of the duchy of Geldres, which the duke of cleves had just seized without the emperor's connivance or consent carne and watton the envoys 
were also to offer the hand of the Princess Mary to the young Duke, and cautiously to hint at a marriage between his sister Anne and Henry, if conditions were favorable, and, like Mont in Saxony, were to close the ranks of Protestantism around the threatened Henry, from whose court both the imperial and French ambassadors had now been withdrawn. Part 3 Whilst these intrigues for Protestant support on the continent were being carried on, and the defences of England on all sides were being strengthened, Henry, apparently for the purpose of disarming the Catholic elements, and proving that, apart from the papal submission, he was as good a Catholic as any, forced through Parliament, May 1539, the extraordinary statute called the Six Articles, or the Bloody Statute, which threw all English Protestants into a panic. The act was drafted on Henry's instructions by Bishop Gardiner, and was called a, quote, act to abolish diversity of opinions, end quote. The Articles of Faith, dictated by the king to his subjects under ferocious penalties, included the main Catholic doctrine, the real presence in the sacrament in its fullest sense, the celibacy of the clergy, that the administration of the sacrament in two kinds is not necessary, that auricular confession is compulsory, that private masses may be said, and that vows of chastity must be kept forever. Cranmer, who was married and had children, dared to argue against the bill when the Duke of Norfolk introduced it in the House of Lords, and others of the new bishops timidly did likewise. But they were overborne by the old bishops, and the great majority of the lay peers, influenced by their traditions and by the peremptory arguments of the king himself. Even more important was an act passed in the same servile parliament, giving to the king's proclamations the force of law, and an act of attainder against everyone, living or dead, in England or abroad, who had opposed the king, completed the terror under which thenceforward the country lay. Henry was now, indeed, master of the bodies and souls of his subjects, and had reduced them all, Protestants and Catholics alike, to a condition of abject subjection to his mere will. The passage of these acts, especially the six articles, marks a temporarily successful attempt of the conservative party, represented by the old bishops and the nobles under Norfolk, to overcome the influence of Cromwell, who was forwarding the Protestant League. But to Henry, the policy must, in any case, have seemed a good one, as it tended to increase his personal power and prestige, and to keep both parties dependent upon him. Before the summer of 1539 had passed, it was evident to Henry that the new combination against him would not stand the strain of a joint attack upon England. Charles was full of cares of his own, the Lutherans were increasingly threatening, even his own city of Ghent had revolted, and it was plain from his reception of Pole at Toledo that he could not proceed to extremes against Henry. It certainly was not the intention of Francis to do so, and the panic in England, never fully justified, passed away. The French ambassador came back and once more Henry's intrigues to sow dissension between the Catholic powers went ceaselessly on. In the circumstances, it was natural that, after the passage of the Six Articles and the resumption of diplomatic relations with France, the negotiations with the German Protestants slackened. But the proposed marriage of Henry with the Princess of Cleves offered too good an opportunity as Cromwell pointed out to him of troubling the emperor when he liked, to be dropped, even though no general political league was effected with the German Lutherans. 
Her brother-in-law, Hans Frederick of Saxony, was cool about it. He said that some sort of engagement had been made by her father and the Duke of Lorraine to marry her to the heir of the latter. But finally, in August, Watton reported from Duren that Hans Frederick would send envoys to Cleves to propose the match, and they would then proceed to England to close the matter. Watton had been somewhat distrustful about the previous engagement of Anne with the Duke of Lorraine's son, but was assured by the Council of Cleves that it was not binding upon the princess, quote, who was free to marry as she pleased. End quote. She has been brought up, he writes, quote, with the Lady Duchess, her mother, and in a manner never from her elbow. The Lady Duchess, being a wise lady, and one that very straightly looketh to her children, all report her, Anne, to be of very lowly and gentle conditions, by the which she hath so much won her mother's favor, that she is loath to suffer her to depart from her she occupieth her time mostly with her needle wherewithal she can read and write dutch but as to french latin or any other language she hath none nor yet she cannot sing nor play any instrument for they take it here in germany for a rebuke and an occasion of lightness that great ladies should be learned or have any knowledge of music her wit is good, and she will no doubt learn English soon when she puts her mind to it. I could never hear that she is inclined to the good cheer of this country, and marvel it were if she should, seeing that her brother doth so well abstain from it. Your grace's servant, Hans Holbein, hath taken the effigies of my lady Anne and the lady Amelia, and hath expressed their images very lively. End quote. Holbein was not usually a flattering painter to his sitters, and the portrait he sent of Anne was that of a somewhat masculine and large featured, but handsome and intellectual young woman, with fine, soft, contemplative brown eyes, thick lashes, and strong eyebrows. The general appearance is dignified though handicapped by the very unbecoming dutch dress of the period and though there is nothing of the petite sprightliness and soft rotundity that would be likely to attract a man of henry's characteristics the princess cannot have been ill-favoured cromwell some months earlier had reported to henry that mont informed him that quote, everybody praises the lady's beauty both of face and body one said she excelled the Duchess of Milan, as the golden sun did the silver moon. End quote. If the latter statement be near the truth, Anne, in her own way, must have been quite good looking. There was no delay or difficulty in carrying through the arrangements for the marriage. The envoys from Cleves and Saxony arrived in London in September and saw Henry at Windsor. They could offer no great dowry, for Cleves was poor, but they would not be exacting about the appendage to be settled upon the queen by her husband, to whom they left the decision of the sum, and the other covenants as to the eventual succession to her brother's duchy, in case of his death without heirs, were to be the same as those under which her elder sister married Hans Frederick. This was the sort of spirit that pleased Henry in negotiators, and with such he was always disposed to be liberal. He practically waived the dowry, and only urged that the lady should come at once, before the winter was too far advanced. When he suggested that she should come from her home down the Rhine through Holland, and thence by sea to England, the envoys prayed, that she might go through Germany and Flanders by land to Calais, and so across. For, said they, by sea, there will be great peril of capture and insult by some too zealous subjects of the emperor. Quote, Besides, they fear lest, 
the time of year being now cold and tempestuous she might there though she never were so well ordered take such cold or other disease considering she never was before upon the seas as should be to her great peril she is moreover young and beautiful and if she should be transported by sea they fear much how it might alter her complexion End quote. no sooner was the marriage treaty signed than splendid preparations were made for the reception of the king's coming bride the lord admiral fitzwilliam was ordered to prepare a fleet of ten vessels to escort her from calais repairs and redecorations of the royal residences went on apace and especially in the queen's apartments where again the initials of poor jane had to be altered to those of her successor and the quote, principal lords have bought much cloth of gold and silk a thing unusual for them except for some great solemnity End quote. the conclusion of the treaty was a triumph for cromwell and the protestant party in henry's council and the commissioners who signed it reflect the fact cranmer cromwell the duke of suffolk lord chancellor audley and lord admiral fitzwilliam were all of them inclined to the reforming side whilst bishop tunstall though on the catholic side was a personal friend of the king and the new man hertford jane seymour's brother though not one of the commissioners gave emphatic approval of the match Quote, i am as glad he wrote to cromwell of the good resolution of the marriage as ever i was of a thing since the birth of the prince for i think the king's highness could not in christendom marry in any place meet for his grace's honour that should be less prejudicial to his majesty's succession henry himself was in his usual vaunting mood about the alliance he had long desired he said to cement a union with the german confederation and could now disregard both france and the emperor besides his influence would suffice to prevent the lutherans from going too far in their religious innovations as for the lady he had only one male child and he was convinced that his desire for more issue could not be better fulfilled quote, than with the said lady who is of convenient age healthy temperament elegant stature and endowed with other graces End quote the news of the engagement was ill received by francis and charles they became more ostentatiously friendly than ever and their ambassadors in london were inseparable when Marillac and the emperor's temporary envoy went together to tell cromwell that the emperor was so confident of the friendship of francis that he was riding through france from spain to flanders the english minister quite lost his composure he was informed he told the ambassadors that this meeting of the monarchs was quote, merely with the view to making war on this poor king henry who aimed at nothing but peace and friendship end quote. ominous mutterings came too from flanders at the scant courtesy henry had shown in throwing over the match with the duchess of milan in the midst of the negotiation cromwell was therefore full of anxiety whilst the elaborate preparations were being made in calais and in england for the new queen's reception not only was a fresh household to be appointed the nobility and gentry and their retinue summoned fine clothes galore ordered or enjoined for others the towns on the way from dover to be warned of the welcome expected from them and the hundred details dependent upon the arrival and installation of the king's fourth wife but henry himself had to be carefully handled to prevent the fears engendered by the attitude of his rivals causing him to turn to the party opposed to cromwell before the protestant marriage was effected in the meanwhile anne 
with a great train of guards and courtiers three hundred horsemen strong rode from dusseldorf towards calais through cleves antwerp bruges and dunkirk it was ordered that lord lyle lord deputy of calais should meet the queen on the english frontier near govlin and that at st pierre lord admiral fitzwilliam who had a fleet of fifty sail in the harbour should greet her in the name of his king gorgeously dressed in blue velvet smothered with gold embroidery and faced with crimson satin royal blue and crimson the king's colours in velvet damask and silk being the universal wear even of the sailors and men-at-arms the aged duke of suffolk and the lord warden were to receive her on her landing at dover and at canterbury she was to be welcomed and entertained by archbishop cranmer norfolk and a great company of armed nobles were to greet the new queen on the downs beyond rochester whilst the queen's household with lady margaret douglas the king's niece and the duchess of richmond his daughter-in-law were to join her at deptford and the whole vast and glittering multitude were to convey her thence to where the king's pavilions were erected for her reception at blackheath in the midwinter twilight of early morning on the eleventh december fifteen thirty nine anne's cavalcade entered the english town of calais and during the long time she remained weather-bound there she was entertained as sumptuously as the nobles and townsmen could entertain her the day she had passed through dunkirk in the emperor's dominions just before coming to calais a sermon was preached against her and all lutherans but with that exception no molestation was offered to her the ship that was to carry her over dressed fore and aft with silken flags streamers and banners was exhibited to her admiration by fitzwilliam royal salutes thundered welcome to her bands of martial music clashed in her honor and banquets and jousts were held to delight her good sense and modesty were shown by her in many ways at this somewhat trying time her principal mentor chancellor alsiliger begged fitzwilliam to advise her as to her behavior and she herself asked him to teach her some game of cards that the king of england usually played he taught her a game which he calls scent which she did learn with good grace and countenance and she then begged him to come to sup with her and bring some noble folk with him to sit with her in the german way he told her that this was not the fashion in england but he accepted her invitation thus anne began betimes to prepare for what she hoped greatly daring would be a happily married life in england whilst the wind and the waves thundering outside the harbour forbade all attempt to convey the bride to her now expectant bridegroom henry had intended to keep christmas with unusual state at greenwich in the company of his new wife but week after week slipped by with the wind still contrary and it was the twenty seventh december before a happy change of weather enabled anne to set sail for her new home she had a stout heart for the passage was a rough though rapid one when she landed at deal and thence after a short rest was conducted in state to dover castle the wind blew blusterously and the hail and winter sleet drove quote, continually in her grace's face end quote but she would hear of no delay in her journey forward quote, so desirous was her grace of reaching the king's presence end quote. at canterbury the citizens received her with a great torchlight procession and peals of guns quote, in her chamber were forty or fifty gentlewomen waiting to receive her in velvet bonnets all of which she took very joyously and was so glad to see the king's subjects 
resorting to her so lovingly that she forgot all the foul weather and was very merry at supper End quote. and so with an evident determination to make the best of everything anne rode onward accompanied by an ever-growing cavalcade of sumptuously bedizened folk through sittingbourne and so to rochester where she was lodged at the bishop's palace and passed new year's day fifteen forty news daily reached the king of his bride's approach whilst he remained consumed with impatience at greenwich at each successive stage of her journey forward supple courtiers had written to henry glowing accounts of the beauty and elegance of the bride fitzwilliam from calais had been especially emphatic and the king's curiosity was piqued to see the paragon he was to marry at length when he knew that anne was on the way from sittingbourne to rochester and would arrive there on new year's eve he told cromwell that he himself with an escort of eight gentlemen clad in gray would ride to rochester incognito to get early sight of his bride quote, whom he sorely desired to see end quote. he went he said quote, to nourish love end quote, and full of hopeful anticipation henry on a great courser ambered over gad's hill from gravesend to rochester soon after dawn on new year's day fifteen forty with sir anthony brown his master of the horse on one side and sir john russell on the other it was in accordance with the chivalrous tradition that this should be done and that the lady should pretend to be extremely surprised when she was informed who her visitor was so that anne must have made a fair guess as to what was coming when sir anthony brown riding a few hundred yards ahead of his master entered her presence and kneeling told her that he had brought a new year's gift for her when the courtier raised his eyes and looked critically upon the lady before him experienced as he was in henry's tastes quote, he was never more dismayed in his life to see her so far unlike that which was reported End quote. anne was about twenty-four years of age but looked older and her frame was large bony and masculine which in the facial portraits that had been sent to henry was not indicated and her large low german features deeply pitted with the ravages of smallpox were as brown knew the very opposite of the type of beauty which would be likely to stimulate a gross unwholesome voluptuary of nearly fifty so with a sinking heart he went back to his master not daring to prepare him for what was before him by any hint of disparagement of the bride as soon as henry entered with russell and brown and saw for himself his countenance fell and he made a wry face which those who knew him understood too well and they trembled in their shoes at what was to come of it he nevertheless greeted the lady politely raising her from the kneeling position she had assumed and kissed her upon the cheek passing a few minutes in conversation with her about her long journey he had brought with him some rich presents of sables and other furs but he was quote, so marvelously astonished and abashed end quote, that he had not the heart to give them to her but sent them the next morning with a cold message by sir anthony brown in the night the royal barge had been brought round from gravesend to rochester and the king returned to greenwich in the morning by water he had hardly passed another word with anne since the first meeting though they had supped together and it was with a sulky frowning face that he took his place in the shelter of his galley turning to russell he asked do you think this woman so fair or of such beauty as report has made her russell courtier-like 
fenced with the question by feigning to misunderstand it i should hardly take her to be fair he replied but of brown complexion alas continued the king whom should men trust i promise you i see no such thing in her as hath been showed unto me of her and am ashamed that men have so praised her as they have done i like her not to brown he was quite as outspoken i see nothing in this woman as men report of her he said angrily and i am surprised that wise men should make such reports as they have done whereat brown who knew that his brother-in-law fitzwilliam was one of the wise men referred to scented danger and was silent the english ladies too who had accompanied anne on the road began to whisper in confidence to their spouses that anne's manners were coarse and that she would never suit the king's fastidious taste but he who had most to lose and most to fear was cromwell it was he who had drawn and driven his master into the protestant friendship against the emperor and the pope of which the marriage was to be the pledge and he had repeated eagerly for months the inflated praises of anne's beauty sent by his agents and friends in order to pique henry to the union he knew that vigilant enemies of himself and his policy were around him watching for their opportunity norfolk and the older nobles the pope's bishops and above all able ambitious stephen gardiner now sulking at winchester determined to supplant him if he could when on friday the second january henry entered his working closet at greenwich after his water journey from rochester cromwell asked him quote, how he liked the lady anne end quote. the king answered gloomily nothing so well as she was spoken of adding that if he had known before as much as he knew then she should never have come within his realm in the grievous self-pity usual with him in his perplexity he turned to cromwell the man hitherto so fertile in expedients and wailed what is the remedy cromwell for once at a loss could only express his grief and say he knew of none in very truth it was too late now to stop the state reception for preparations had been ordered for such a pageant as had rarely been seen in england cromwell had intended it for his own triumph and as marking the completeness of his victory over his opponents once more ambition overleaped itself and the day that was to establish cromwell's supremacy sealed his doom part four what anne thought of the situation is not on record she had seen little of the world outside the coarse boorishness of a petty low german court she was neither educated nor naturally refined and she probably looked upon the lumpishness of her lover as an ordinary thing in any case she baited none of her state and apparent contentment as she rode gorgeously bedight with her great train towards greenwich at the foot of shooter's hill there had been erected an imposing pavilion of cloth of gold and diverse other tents warmed with fires of perfumed wood and here a company of ladies awaited the coming of the queen on saturday third january fifteen forty a broad way was cleared from the pavilion across woolwich common and blackheath for over two miles to the gates of greenwich park and the merchants and corporation of london joined with the king's retinue in lining each side of this long lane cromwell had recently gained the goodwill of foreigners settled in london by granting them exemption from special taxation for a term of years and he had claimed as some return 
that they should make the most of this day of triumph accordingly the german merchants of the steelyard the venetians the spaniards the french and the rest of them donned new velvet coats and jaunty crimson caps with white feathers each master with a smartly clad servant behind him and so stood each side of the way to do honour to the bride at the greenwich end of the route then came the english merchants the corporation of london the knights and gentlemen who had been bidden from the country to do honour to their new queen the gentlemen pensioners the halberdiers and around the tent the nobler courtiers and queen's household all brave in velvet and gold chains behind the ranks of gentlemen and servitors there was ample room and verge enough upon the wide heath for the multitudes who came to gape and cheer king harry's new wife more than a little perplexed in many cases as to the minimum amount of enthusiasm which would be accepted as seemly cromwell himself marshalled the ranks on either side quote, running up and down with a staff in his hand for all the world as if he had been running postman end quote, as an eyewitness tells us it was midday before the queen's procession rode down shooter's hill to the tents where she was met by her official household and greeted with a long latin oration which she did not understand whilst she sat in her chariot then heartily kissing the great lady sent to welcome her she alighted and entered the tent to rest and warm herself over the perfumed fires and to don even more magnificent raiment than that she wore when she was ready for her bridegroom's coming she must have been a blaze of magnificence she wore a wide skirt of cloth of gold with a raised pattern in bullion and no train and her head was covered first with a close cap and then a round cap covered with pearls and fronted with black velvet whilst her bodice was one glittering mass of precious stones when swift messengers brought news that the king was coming and mounted at the door of the tent a beautiful white palfrey and surrounded by her servitors each bearing upon his golden coat the black lion of cleves and followed by her train she set forth to meet her husband henry unwieldy and lame as he was with a running ulcer in his leg was as vain and fond of pomp as ever and outdid his bride in splendour his coat was of purple velvet cut like a frock embroidered all over with a flat gold pattern interlined with narrow gold braid and with gold lace laid crosswise over it all a velvet overcoat surmounted the gorgeous garment lined also with gold tissue the sleeves and breast held together with great buttons of diamonds rubies and pearls his sword and belt were covered with emeralds and his bonnet and undercap were quote, so rich in jewels that few men could value them End quote. whilst across his shoulders he wore a baldric composed of precious stones and pearls that was the wonder of all beholders the fat giant thus bedizened bestrode a great war-horse to match and almost equally magnificent and preceded by heralds and trumpeters followed by the great officers the royal household and the bishops and accompanied by the duke philip of bavaria just betrothed to the princess mary henry rode through the long lane of his velvet-clad admirers to meet anne hard by the cross upon blackheath when she approached him he doffed his jewelled bonnet and bowed low and then embraced her whilst she with every appearance of delight and duty expressed her pleasure at meeting him thus together with their great cavalcade united over five thousand horsemen strong they rode in the waning light of a midwinter afternoon to greenwich and as one who saw it but knew not the tragedy that lurked behind the splendour exclaimed quote, 
Oh, what a sight was this to see! So goodly a prince and so noble a king to ride with so fair a lady of so goodly a stature, and so womanly a countenance, and a special of so good qualities. I think no creature could see them, but his heart rejoiced. End quote. There was one heart, at all events, that did not rejoice, and that was Henry's. He went heavily through the ceremony of welcoming home his bride in the great hall at Greenwich, and then led her to her chamber. But no sooner had he got quit of her than, retiring to his own room, he summoned Cromwell. Well, he said, is it not as I told you? Say what they will. She is nothing like so fair as she was reported to be. She is well and seemly, but nothing else. Cromwell, confused, could only mumble something about her having a queenly manner. But Henry wanted the way out of his bargain, rather than reconciliation to it, and he ordered Cromwell to summon the council at once, Norfolk, Suffolk, Cromwell, Cranmer, Fitzwilliam, and Tunstall, to consider the prior engagement made between Anne and the Duke of Lorraine's son. The question had already been discussed and disposed of, and the revival of it, thus, at the eleventh hour, shows how desperate Henry was. The council assembled immediately, and summoned the German envoys who had negotiated the marriage, and were now in attendance on Anne. The poor men were thunderstruck, at the point of an impediment to the marriage being raised then, and begged to be allowed to think the matter over till the next morning, Sunday. When they met the council again in the morning, they could only protest that the prior covenant had only been a betrothal, which had never taken effect, and had been formally annulled. If there was any question about it, however, they offered to remain as prisoners in England until the original deed of revocation was sent from Cleves. When this answer was carried to Henry, he broke out angrily that he was not being well treated, and upbraided Cromwell for not finding a loophole for escape. He did not wish to marry the woman, he said. Quote, if she had not come so far, and such great preparations made, and for fear of making a ruffle in the world, of driving her brother into the hands of the emperor and the French king, he never would marry her. End quote. Cromwell was apparently afraid to encourage him in the idea of repudiation, and said nothing. And after dinner the king again summoned the council to his presence. To them he bitterly complained of having been deceived. Would the lady, he asked, make a formal protestation before notaries that she was free from all contracts? Of course she would, and did, as soon as she was asked. But Henry's idea in demanding this is evident. If she had refused, it would give a pretext for delay. But if she did as desired, and by any quibble, the prior engagement was found to be valid, her protestation to the contrary would be good grounds for a divorce. But still, Henry would much rather not have married her at all. Oh, is there no other remedy? he asked despairingly on Monday, after Anne had made her protestation. Must I needs against my will? put my neck into the yoke? Cromwell could give him no comfort, and left him gloomy at the prospect of going through the ceremony on the morrow. On Tuesday morning, when he was appareled for the wedding, as usual, in a blaze of magnificence of crimson satin and cloth of gold, Cromwell entered his chamber on business. My lord, said Henry, if it were not to satisfy the world in my realm, I would not do what I must do this day for any earthly thing. But withal, he went through it as best he might, though with heavy heart and gloomy countenance, and the unfortunate bride, we are told, was remarked to be, quote, demure and sad, end quote, as well as she might be, when her husband and Cranmer placed upon her finger 
the wedding ring with the ominous inscription quote, god send me well to keep End quote. early the next morning cromwell entered the king's chamber between hope and fear and found henry frowning and sulky how does your grace like the queen he asked henry grumblingly and not quite relevantly replied that he cromwell was not everybody and then he broke out surely my lord as you know i liked her not well before but now i like her much worse with an incredible grossness and want of common decency he then went into certain details of his wife's physical qualities that had disgusted him and turned him against her he did not believe from certain peculiarities that he described that she was a maid he said but so far as he was concerned he was so quote, struck to the heart end quote, that he had left her as good a maid as he had found her nor was the king more reticent with others he was free with his details to the gentlemen of his chamber denny heneage and others as to the signs which it pleased him to consider suspicious as touching his wife's previous virtue and protested that he never could or would consummate the marriage though he professed later that for months after the wedding he did his best to overcome his repugnance and lived constantly in contact with his wife but he never lost sight of the hope of getting free if he did not find means soon to do so he said he should have no more issue his conscience told him that tender conscience of his that anne was not his legal wife and he turned to cromwell for a remedy and found none for cromwell knew that the breaking up of the protestant union upon which he had staked his future would inevitably mean now the rise of his rivals and his own ruin he fought stoutly for his position though norfolk and gardiner were often now at the king's ear his henchman dr barnes who had gone to germany as envoy during the marriage negotiations was a protestant and in a sermon on justification by faith he violently attacked gardiner the latter in spite of cromwell and cranmer secured from the king an order that barnes should humbly and publicly recant he did so at easter at the spittal but at once repeated the offence and he and two other clergymen who thought like him were burnt for heresy men began to shake their heads and look grave now as they spoke of cromwell and cranmer but the secretary stood sturdily and in may seemed as if he would turn the tables upon his enemies once indeed he threatened the duke of norfolk roughly with the king's displeasure and at the opening of parliament he took the lead as usual expressing the king's sorrow at the religious bitterness in the country and demanding large supplies for the purposes of national defence but though still apparently as powerful as ever and more than ever overbearing he dared not yet propose to the king a way out of the matrimonial tangle going home to austin friars from the sitting of parliament on the seventh june he told his new colleague riothlessly that the thing that principally troubled him was that the king did not like the queen and that his marriage had never been consummated riothlessly whose sympathies were then catholic suggested that quote, some way might be devised for the relief of the king end quote. ah sighed cromwell who knew what such a remedy would mean to him quote, but it is a great matter end quote. the next day riothlessly returned to the subject and begged cromwell to devise some means of relief for the king quote, for if he remained in this grief and trouble they should all smart for it some day End quote. yes replied cromwell it is true but it is a great matter 
mary exclaimed ryothlessly out of patience i grant that but let a remedy be searched for but cromwell had no remedy yet but one that would ruin himself and that he dared not propose so he shook his head sadly and changed the subject the repudiation of anne was as cromwell said a far greater matter than at first sight appeared the plan to draw into one confederation for the objects of england the german protestants the king of denmark and the duke of cleves whose seizure of gelderland had brought him in opposition to the emperor was the most threatening that had faced charles for years his own city of ghent was an open revolt and francis after all was but a fickle ally if once more the french king turned from him and made friends with the turk and the lutherans then indeed would the imperial power have cause to tremble and henry to rejoice cromwell had striven hard to cement the protestant combination but again and again he had been thwarted by his rivals the passage of the six articles against his wish although the execution of the act was suspended at cromwell's instance had caused the gravest distrust on the part of hans frederick and the landgrave of hesse and if henry were encouraged to repudiate his german wife not only would her brother already in negotiation with the imperial agents for the investiture of Geldris, and his marriage with the emperor's niece the duchess of milan be at once driven into opposition to england but hans frederick and hesse would also abandon henry to the tender mercies of his enemies the only way to avoid such a disaster following the repudiation of anne was first to drive a wedge of distrust between charles and francis now in close confederacy in january the emperor had surprised the world by his boldness in traversing france to his flemish dominions he was feasted splendidly by francis and escaped unbetrayed but during his stay in france desperate attempts were made by wyatt henry's ambassador with charles bonner the ambassador in france and by the duke of norfolk who went in february on a special mission to sow discord between the allied sovereigns and not without some degree of success charles during his stay in france was badgered by wyatt into saying some hasty words which were deliberately twisted by norfolk into a menace to france and england alike francis was reminded with irritating iteration that charles had plenty of smiles and soft words for his french friends but avoided keeping his promises about the cession of milan or anything else so in france those who were in favor of the imperial alliance the montmorencys and the queen declined in their hold over francis and their opponents the barons the queen of navarre francis's sister and the duchess of etampes his mistress planned with henry's agents for an understanding with england this as may be supposed was not primarily cromwell's policy but that of norfolk and his friends because its success would inevitably mean the conciliation of the german princes and cleves by the emperor and the break-up of the protestant confederacy and england by which cromwell must now stand or fall as early as april marillac the french ambassador in england foretold the great change that was coming the arrest of barnes gerard and jerome for anti-catholic teaching and the persecutions everywhere for those who offended ever so slightly in the same way presaged cromwell's fall Quote, cranmer and cromwell writes marillac do not know where they are within a few days there will be seen in this country a great change in many things which this king begins to make in his ministers 
recalling those he had disgraced and degrading those he had raised cromwell is tottering for all those now recalled were dismissed at his request and bear him no little grudge amongst others the bishops of winchester that is gardiner durham and bath men of great learning and experience who are now summoned to the privy council it is said that tunstall that is durham will be vicar general and bath privy seal which are cromwell's principal offices if he holds his own that is cromwell it will only be because of his close assiduity in business though he is very rude in his demeanor he does nothing without consulting the king and is desirous of doing justice especially to foreigners End quote. This was somewhat premature, but it gives a good idea of the process that was going on. There is no doubt that Cromwell believed in his ability to keep his footing politically, for he was anything but rigid in his principles, and if the friendship with France, initiated by his rivals, had, as it showed signs of doing, developed into an alliance that would enable Henry both to dismiss his fears of the emperor and throw over the protestants he would probably have accepted the situation and have proposed a means for henry to get rid of his distasteful wife but this opportunism did not suit his opponents in henry's council they wanted to get rid of the man quite as much as they did his policy for his insolence had stung them to the quick great nobles as most of them were and he the son of a blacksmith some other means therefore than a mere change of policy was necessary to dislodge the strong man who guided the king parliament had met on the twelfth april and it was managed with cromwell's usual boldness and success as if to mark that his great ability was still paramount he was made earl of essex and great chamberlain of england in the following week but the struggle in the council and around the king continued unabated henry was warned by cromwell's enemies of the danger of allowing religious freedom to be carried too far and of thus giving the catholic powers an excuse for executing the pope's decree of deprivation against him he was reminded that the emperor and francis were still friends that the latter was suspiciously preparing for war and that henry's brother-in-law the duke of cleves quarrel with the emperor might drag england into war for the sake of a beggarly german dukedom of no importance or value to her on the other hand cromwell would point out to henry the disobedience and insolence of the catholics who questioned his spiritual supremacy and caused churchmen who advocated a reconciliation with rome to be imprisoned clearly such a position could not continue indefinitely and norfolk anticipated cromwell by playing the final trump card that of arousing henry's personal fears the word treason and a hint that anything could be intended against his person always brought henry to heel what the exact accusation against cromwell was no one knows though it was whispered at the time that the nobles had told henry that cromwell had amassed great stores of money and arms and maintained a vast number of dependents fifteen hundred men it was asserted wore his livery with a sinister object some said to marry the princess mary and make himself king and that he had received a great bribe from the duke of cleves and the protestants to bring about the marriage of anne others said that he had boasted that he was to receive a crown abroad from a foreign potentate that is the emperor and that he had talked of defending the new doctrines at the sword's point no such accusations however are on official record and there is no doubt that the real reason for his arrest 
was the animosity of the aristocratic and Catholic party against him, acting upon the king's fears and his desire to get rid of Anne of Cleves. On the 9th June, Parliament was still sitting, discussing the religious question with a view to the settlement of some uniform doctrine. The lords of the council left the chamber to go across to Whitehall to dinner before midday, and as they wended their way across the great courtyard of Westminster, a high wind carried away Cromwell's flat cap from his head. It was the custom when one gentleman was even accidentally uncovered for those who were with him also to doff their bonnets. But as an attendant ran and recovered Cromwell's flying headgear on that occasion, the haughty minister looked grimly round and saw all his colleagues, once so humble, holding their own caps upon their heads. A high wind indeed must this be, sneered Cromwell to blow my cap off, and for you to need hold yours on. He must have known that ill foreboded, for during dinner no one spoke to him. The meal finished, Cromwell went to the council chamber with the rest, and, as was his custom, stood at a window apart to hear appeals and applications to him, and when these were disposed of, he turned to the table to take his usual seat with the rest. On this occasion, Norfolk stopped him and told him that it was not meet that traitors should sit amongst loyal gentlemen. I am no traitor, shouted Cromwell, dashing his cap upon the ground. But the captain of the guard was at the door, and still protesting, the wretched man was hurried to the water gate and rode swiftly to the tower, surrounded by halberdiers. Norfolk, as he left the council chamber, tearing off the fallen minister's badge of the garter as a last stroke of ignominy. Cromwell knew he was doomed, for by the iniquitous act that he himself had forged for the ruin of others, he might be attainted and condemned legally without his presence or defense. Mercy, 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 he wrote to the king in his agony, but for him there was as little mercy as he had shown to others. His death was a foregone conclusion, for Henry's fears had been aroused. But Cromwell had to be kept alive long enough for him to furnish such information as would provide a plausible pretext for the repudiation of Anne. He was ready to do all that was asked of him, to swear to anything the king wished. He testified that he knew the marriage had never been consummated, and never would be, that the king was dissatisfied from the first, and had complained that the evidence of the nullification of the prior contract with the heir of Lorraine was insufficient, that the king had never given full consent to the marriage, but had gone through the ceremony under the compulsion of circumstances, and with mental reservation. When all this was sworn to, Cromwell's hold upon the world was done. Upon evidence now unknown, he was condemned for treason and heresy without being heard in his own defense, and on the 28th July, 1540, he stood a sorry figure, upon the scaffold in the tower. He had been a sinner, he confessed, and had travailed after the things of this world, but he fervently avowed that he was a good Catholic and no heretic, and had harbored no thought of evil towards his sovereign. But protestations availed not, and his head, the cleverest head in England, was pitiably hacked off by a bungling headsman. Before that happened, the repudiation of Anne of Cleves was complete, and a revival of the aristocratic and Catholic influence in England was an accomplished fact. <laughs>